And good morning again, this Pentecost morning. And it looks to be a beautiful day. And I didn't look to see what the rest of the weather was going to be like for the week because we pray um, that we have a beautiful week this week. We deserve one. And let's pray for a beautiful Sunday next week. So as I mentioned earlier, hopefully, perhaps, just perhaps, we might be able to worship outside in God's creation. But today we are talking about Pentecost. Again, we are in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, for those that want to get uh, their Bibles out. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. So the first 21 verses in Acts is where we're at in chapter 2. And we're talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Fancy that we would talk about that on Pentecost Sunday, right, Catherine? That's a funny thing to preach upon. Uh, though I think for the last couple of years I've chosen to preach over John's Gospel on, on Sunday. Um, this is one of those things that comes up every year, is this is Acts chapter 2. Um, and it's one of those things I've commented on before that, that, that as a pastor sometimes you go, oh my gosh, not again, do I have to preach over this again? Um, and how many new things can I ferret out of this? How, what more insight can I bring? Uh, and it becomes more difficult the longer you're at it. And so I think this is about the fifth time I've preached over Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. Um, so there is a danger of becoming dull to, to the, verse, the verses, and we, we have to fight off that. Um, but as I've said all along, during this time of, of uh, unrest and, and, and worry about COVID-19, and now as we compound that with all of this social unrest that we're dealing with right now, um, perhaps it's a good time to have some of these old verses that we really all know and that we all cling to. Let's remember them because remembering and repetition are not bad things. Uh, so let's talk about Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Lyrigian and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And of course, that is what's often thought of as the beginning of the church. We call that many times Pentecost Sunday. And I don't know that I, it's the, it's the beginnings in that out of this we, we become the church when we get coming up the Spirit. But it's important to remember that it's going to be a number of years before the disciples really break from Judaism entirely. They are still at that time uh, looking at amongst themselves and at themselves as being Jews, Jewish. Uh, it's just Jews for Jesus. 
there is a Jew for Jesus group today up today. So uh, that we need to remember. Um, Pentecost, of course, comes uh, 50 days after Passover. Um, and it is, a, it is a celebration. It's one of the major celebrations of the Jewish year. It's one of the three festivals in which there, you, if you were within, a, I forget what the distance is, of Jerusalem as a Jewish male, you were supposed to go to Jerusalem. Um, so it's thought that if at any time there might be more people in Jerusalem than at Passover, it would be at Pentecost. So this is the, you know, some, some scholars will put the numbers at upwards of a million people being in the city at this time. So it's a crowded place. You've got people with all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of, of different nationalities, speaking many different, different dialects and, 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 uh, and all of that. So... Uh, and we do have to remember differences in dialects because uh, that's, that's something that just popped in my head. Because if you remember just English, if you've ever spoken to somebody from Australia or somebody from England or somebody from India, we don't speak the language exactly the same and we don't use the language exactly the same. So even for us speaking the same language to really communicate is difficult. It's even difficult for us here speaking the same language uh, to communicate. So communication is a difficult thing. So the idea that we have this, this, this breakthrough of absolute clarity of communication is truly a miraculous thing. Uh, it's a miracle we could use today um, to be able to clearly communicate and articulate with one another. Um, the beginning of this uh, bit of scripture when we're talking about the coming of the Spirit, it's important to remember that in the Greek it's clear the Spirit is not in this, this, this wind, and it's actually not, the word there is the translated wind, it actually means like an echo. So it's kind of a strange thing, it's very confusing in the Greek, uh, but they, they, they translate it as a violent wind, but it's like a loud echo kind of a thing. Um, so it's, again, it's, a, it's kind of strange language, not particularly clear, we just talk about clarity. Um, and the tongue, divided tongues as of fire. It's not saying that they are fire. We like that picture of flame. It's as if that, you know, he's trying to come up with some way to, to illustrate it and to, to get you to grasp the feeling of that. Um, because it would be like when we, we, we talk about being a wave of emotion overcame us. Now we're not talking about a literal wave coming down. But those of us that have, that have experienced emotional things, whether it be loss or joy or what have you, I think we can understand what that means. And so it, this is like a, this is actually like a wave coming at them. Because where it says that the, the, the tongue rested on each of them, it's not like it was all oh, this gentle thing. It's like it laid on them. It's, in the Greek, it's weighty. It has substance. It's a feeling, a sensation. So it's it's not it's not something that they don't understand that there, there's something going on. It's like that sudden rush of emotion that you feel. They feel it. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other languages. Um, and again, I, I'll back up just a little bit. This the, the language here is very much reminiscent of First Kings chapter 19, 11, and twelve. Uh, if you go back and read that, uh, it says. That the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. The Lord was in the whisper. So all of this flash and gore that we have, this, this, this metaphor of, the idea is not that the spirit is in the fire or the wind. The spirit is in them. It's what fills them. It's the whisper, the gentle whisper. It's that feeling you have inside of yourself. It may, may be dramatic to you, but someone outside doesn't sense it. So there's no, first of all, there's also in the script, in Acts, there's no indication that the people that are looking at the disciples see these little flames above them. It's not like the little big lighters with this little flame above their head. Um, or big thick lighters. Um, there's no indication that those that those people see that. So it's we look at that as as metaphoric, though it is a beautiful metaphor, and it gives us this idea of why we wear red on Pentecost. I don't have as much red on as usual, um, but. 
Then we come to the speaking in other languages as the Lord gave them ability. Now, which day we, we you know, we, uh, the, the Pentecostal, the, 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 the uh, charismatic movement is very much big on um, on the, the the speaking in tongues and all of that. Generally, there though, it's the, the, what you have there is is unintelligible type of language, uh, things that, that we don't understand. And, 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 but that's not what's going on here. And that's not what the coming of the Spirit and the speaking in tongues means, at least here. Here, again, it's about the clarity of communication. Um, because everybody understands it. And what everybody's understanding, um, that they're speaking in their native tongue, first of all. And we all have a native tongue. We all have a mother tongue. We all have this 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 one language, or I shouldn't say all, because some people perhaps communicate think to themselves in multiple languages. Uh, but most of us, at least in this country, we speak to ourselves in, in English, even if we know Spanish or what have you. Um, we, when we when we think in our mind, we, we we think in a different language. I can remember we used to have exchange students and people working for us um, at the ranch, and my 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 family still has a lot of people that come over from South Africa. To work for them and they'll stay and then they go back and they, they're coming over to learn American agricultural ways and they have one bunkhouse that, that still they have the South Africans live there but I can remember talking to a, a, a fellow that was there working with us that, that was Dutch and talking to him in very good English and we're branded calves, and I can remember that. We're, we're working on calves, and he was working the shoot, and I was brand doing the branding, and, and we're, so we're working the calves, and I'm talking to this young guy, and, and we were about the, we were the same age, you know, very young, good looking too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and, and I asked him, I said, now when you're thinking, you know, because we're talking in English, it's when you're talking, you know, you, how many languages, you know, he knew like four or five languages. I'm like, well, when you're, when you're thinking in your head, you know, when you're talking to me, are you thinking in English and then talking to me in English? She says, no. I think the thought in Dutch and then I translate it. And I thought that was just so interesting. But that's his, that's his, that's his mother tongue. That's his native language. That's the thought. That's what, you know, the, the clearest way to communicate with him would have been for me uh, to have been able to speak Dutch. And of course, for the clearest way for him to communicate with me was for him to speak English. And of course, unfortunately, I only know English. Um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not bilingual, or any, I'm barely. I barely speak one language. Um, so I found that interesting. But that's what's going on here, so that these people can clearly understand and have feel the most close to God. They're being spoken to in their most comfortable manner, their mother tongue, their native language, and so the, 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 they are remarking that these these people are all speaking in all these. They're all Galileans, of course. Galileans would be like somebody who comes from the south. How do I know you're from the south? Well, because you have a southern drawl. The Galileans have their accent. How do I know you're from Minnesota? Well, you won't believe that. Um, <laughs> I'm not picking on Minnesotans because of what's going on in Minneapolis. I'm picking on them because of their, their accent. Um, though back home, there was a little town of Oklahoma. And Oklahoma, the odd thing about Oklahoma was, little town, they had their own accent. And you could tell when someone was from um, by the way they talked. It, it was interesting. Um, so we, 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 we have these fellows speaking these other languages, but they're speaking with a Galilean accent so that they know they're Galilean. Um, but they're speaking in all these many different languages. And I've talked about this before, but I think this is really the crutch of this whole thing, is that the miracle, we talk about the miracle being in the speaking over and over, and we make Great emphasis on the miracle being in the speaking. But the miracle is really in the hearing because it's so very difficult uh, to believe that you could have, you know, the, the, they think there was upwards of 120 disciples here. And you've got people from all over the world, so an unknown number of dialects. They've listed off, I, I've never counted, but they've listed off nearly a dozen or more different dialects here. Um, People from all over the world, parts of Libya, they don't even give all of the things. Visitors from Rome, um, Arabs, there have been probably more than one language of Arabic. Um, they're all speaking in the same language. But if they're all speaking at once, I can't believe that you would understand a single word. 
Because if you've ever been in a crowd, we were in Jerusalem, uh, and we were in, in the spot where they believed this, uh, the, the Pentecost, or the, they were in the upper room, so that we were in the, ho- uh, in the area, the, the house that would have been there is gone, but they built a, 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 a building there um, in that spot where they believed the upper room. They believe this is the same place as the Last Supper. So Gail and I were there. But when you're in Jerusalem and you're in these crowds and you've got people speaking all these different languages, um, it can be overwhelming. And if you think of it being that they're all speaking loudly and proclaiming, because these people are not just, they are preaching is what's going on. Uh, They're talking about God's glory. They are preaching, uh, speaking about God's deeds of power. Um, So uh, you have these multiple sermons going on in all these different languages. There's no way you would understand even the one spoken in your own language. It would over, all of this other babble, Remember the Tower of Babel? All of this would become Babel because that's what happened in the Tower of Babel. Remember the story? The people spoke one language and all of a sudden it became different languages so that nobody could understand anybody. Um, The communication broke down. But all of a sudden we have the reverse of the Tower of Babel. We go from all of these many languages zip to one point where all of a sudden all of them can hear the words spoken in their own language. No matter that they're all, that's all being spoken by Galileans. And I think it's impossible to, to, to downplay the miraculous, the miracle of all of that, and how miraculous that is, and how profound that is, and how, and really should speak to us. Because it is a, it is a message of unity and reconciliation. It's a reversal of this brokenness. It's bringing back to the point where we can understand the, blank, the voice of God, and we can hear clearly in our own understanding about God's deep power. So that to me is a very, very important part of this scripture. And of course, Peter goes on and he and he's talking about, and of course, some of the most ironic thing there, you know, they're, they're saying, oh, they're drunk on new wine. Uh, and he says, look, it's only nine o'clock. Of course they're not, they're, they're not drunk. Uh, because we wouldn't be drinking. And the, 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 as I pointed out before, uh, one of the interesting things about that is that in that culture at that time, uh, they, would have, they were in the practice of eating a meal around 10 o'clock. So Peter's saying, hey, we haven't ate yet. We haven't had our wine yet with our meal. But they would have eat, they, they, when they eat, they would have drank wine along with it because wine was safe to drink, water, man, maybe not so much. Uh, and even when we were there, we were cautioned in, in Israel, we were cautioned not to drink uh, with water out of the fountain we, or, or out of the tap, we were supposed to be drinking bottled water. Um, so um, it, it, it uh, well, don't want to say it. it's uh, they drank wine in those days because of the water having issues, and that happened in a lot of cultures. But what he's saying is, it's not ten yet. We haven't had our wine yet, so of course we've not been drinking yet. And so listen to us. It is an it is an interesting and, and kind of a bit of a whimsical uh, comment there by Peter. But he goes on then, of course, to quote from Joel uh, in the second chapter of Joel, uh, chapter 2, verses 28 to 32 is what he's quoting, the day of the Lord. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. And of course, we we have that message of the Spirit. We have the message of the Spirit coming on those those elders in in the book of Numbers, what we read earlier. So we want to uh, look at that. it's prophesying, is what he's talking about there. Uh, the fulfillment of prophecy, really. So, I think with that, I'm going to move away from speaking on Pentecost so much. Well, I guess I shouldn't say away from speaking about Pentecost. Take a different direction with this. And here's the point in the sermon where the pastor gets himself in trouble. Um, we have in Pentecost a message of, of trying to be spoke to speak and to be heard and to communicate and to understand 
and to be uh, this revelation, this, this, the, the glory of God revealed to us. And right now, we have a problem right now with, with all of this that's going on. We have a great tragedy that has begot more tragedy. And we, we, we are having a problem with voices crying out and voices being drowned out and not wanting to listen to one another and not wanting to truly communicate. We've become the, this, this more, instead of this clarity that we have this beauty and this miracle of, of Pentecost with one, one clear, clear message, we have instead, if we can imagine the Spirit not being there, people speaking all those languages, we have a bunch of babble. With no one attempting to understand the other, each trying to speak and each trying to virtue signal very much, um, to show I care so much more than you uh, because I, I because I posted on Facebook or even if I, I showed up at a protest. So obviously I care more than you and so I feel good and I can go home and now, I'm, and now you know, I'm done with it. Um, there's a great deal of that that's going on. There's a great deal of things that are going on that, that are, are, are not constructive. They're, they're causing problems. And at the risk of being blasted, and I probably will be blasted, I, 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 I say the protests were well intended, and they were, they were necessary, and, and I have no problem with the people going out and protesting at your First Amendment right, and you should speak up. You've been heard, duly noted. Now's the time to stop. Because it should have become clear immediately that, that, that the peaceful protests are, are, are basically providing cover for those that have, have malfeasance in their minds, the malcontents, those that have destruction, those that are trying to plant seeds of division. You're providing cover for them. We don't want to do that. Especially we don't want to do that as the church. Because we're supposed to try to come together. And what we, when we speak and when we do things that, that cause further division, we, we're not doing this work of the Spirit. We're not doing God's work. We need to speak to each other gently, understandingly. And I speak to you gently and understandingly. It's time for the protests to stop. You've been heard. It's understood. I will question, though, some of the things that are going on. We have a problem in the way we address racism in this country. We have a problem the way we address racism within the church. And here's where I really get myself in trouble with, my, with our denominational leaders. One of the things the disciples require is racist training, and of course I'll probably be in, in I'll be sent back to re-indoctrination um, when I say this. But one of the things that is very much a part of that, that training, and anything that I've had for training, is this concept that only one race can be racist. And the inability and the refusal to understand that when you say that only whites are capable of being racist, that you are incredibly racist in saying that. And you are you switched from trying to correct the problem to becoming a big part of the problem. And when you refuse to even look and understand what you just said as being a problem, that's a bigger problem. Yes. Yes, there's a problem with racism. When I my first job away from from uh, South Dakota was I came down to a uh, Omaha and lived in Bellevue and worked in Nebraska City and I worked with a, uh, with a gentleman, a young guy, um, his, his first name was Greg uh, Harris was his last name and Greg was, was a very tall, uh, about, oh, I think he was probably about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, uh, black gentleman. Um, Greg was a wonderful guy, I loved Greg. Um, Always, always made me laugh a little bit because at the time I was a spelt 180 pounds, which I'm unfortunately not down to now. And here I am at 5'8", and Greg was almost a foot taller, and he weighed less than 180 pounds. So I used to tease him about being a beanpole. 
but I did experience with, with Greg, uh, some, some people treating Greg in a racist manner, and I was very upset about it. And, I, and, I, and I, there were times I spoke up to people uh, about <coughs> that uh, when I was with him. Um, so I understand that, there, that, 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 there, that, there, that you can have some problems with race. But conversely, there's places I can't go in this, in this country without being, becoming the victim of racism. So for us to deny that, and, and, and we, we, can, we can lobby and we can profess against institutionalized racism, which I think used to be a problem. I'm not sure that it's the problem, the direction you're thinking now, because when we teach, and the government teaches, and we as a church teach, that only one race can be racist, we have institutionalized racism, and we've forced it the other direction. We've, we've made one group of people fair game for everyone else. And the reality is, is that we all need to be God's children. We all need to love one another. I don't care what color your skin is. I only care what your character is. And if your character is good character, and if you're, you're a gentle human being, you and I will get along just wonderfully. Um, even if we don't agree on anything, but if we can treat each other with respect, I got along great with Greg. And I, I left that job and lost contact with him, but that's unfortunate. Um, but we have to get past this idea, again, that we, that we can somehow have one divide and everyone, I mean, this, this is so illogical to me, I have a hard time articulating. And I have a hard time arguing with people that make that argument and are so adamant in that position. We have to attack hate, no matter where it comes from and who it's coming from. This morning, Reverend Randy over at Union posted one of Martin Luther King's quotes. And Martin Luther King Jr., you've got to remember, was a dear friend of my mentor. Um, and so I have some books in my office that, that Martin Luther King Jr. more than likely, if he, what, what he was, at least was in the same room with them when they were in seminary together, and it's very possible he might have even read them. And so when I pick them up, I find that as extraordinarily humbling. But Martin Luther King Jr. is quoted as having said, returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. That's a wonderful quote. And I will add to this my own thoughts. And I put this on Facebook. We need to remember this. Hating someone for their race is hate. No matter what race you are or what race you hate. Even if you hate your own race. And part of our problem is just that last part. Some of us want to be virtue signaling. We want to show how woke or how hip or how happening we are. And so we hate ourselves because we, we feel like that's, that's, you know, we hate our race. Well, that's not godly. That's not godly at all. You're supposed to love everyone, even to love yourself. I mean, what kind of travesty of God's justice is that? That's irrehensible to say something like that. To, to self-loathe is to hate one of God's children. And it's no better than hating someone because of, and for any other reason. So I, I, I'm appalled by that, and I'm disturbed by that, and I'm saddened and brokenhearted by that. We need to be able to have a... a a common sense communication, and we need to listen to the moderates. I, I, I do paint myself as a moderate. And the thing about moderates like myself is we rarely poke our heads up. Because the problem with being a moderate is you're taking fire from the right and you're taking fire from the left. The other interesting thing, though, is, is that people like Dave Rubin, if you don't follow Dave Rubin, who is, I believe, a moderate, um, they realize real quickly that the most vicious fire comes from the left, though. That doesn't mean you don't get some from the right as well, but the most vicious fire comes from the left because you have
have to, you, you glamorize and you glorify um, self-loathing. You glamorize and glorify, um, you know, all of these things. Um, and you enable. By, by, by saying that only one party can be, be racist, we enable racism. And we advance racism. We perpetuate and propagate, we nurture and fertilize racism, and it becomes worse. Because by you saying that ultimately in extraordinarily racist terms, you have just made this person over here that might not have been racist before go, oh my gosh, you know, you're coming after me simply because of my race. So therefore, I don't like you because of your race. There can be no justice if there is not first grace. There can be no reconciliation if there is not first grace. We, if we truly want to be a movement for wholeness and a movement for justice, we need to stop behaving like we all have been. And I'm pointing fingers at several denominations, but most pointedly the, the, the DOC. We say we want to be a voice of wholeness, but yet we go to a disciples meeting, or if you go to a Baptist meeting, it's almost as bad, but disciples are worse. And I'm really getting myself in trouble. But if you go there as a moderate, you're in trouble. If you go there as a conservative, you're in deep doo-doo. You're going to be attacked, and you're going to be insulted. Um, and some of that will be direct, and some of it will be, be just cheap shots. Um, we shouldn't do that. We need to stop that. We'll never heal the world if we don't stop that. So don't dare speak to me about healing the world when you do that. And don't dare speak to me about Black Lives Matters when we as a denomination embrace and endorse and advocate and have ministers to go and bless abortion clinics. Approximately 800 black children are aborted every day day in the United States of America. Do you see a massive protest about the injustice of the snuffing out of an absolutely innocent life? Now, Mr. Floyd had both good and bad in his life. If you could, not knowing what to trust and what not to trust, we can see that he was like most of us, and he was a conflicted man, an imperfect man, but a love, man that God loved. And so we don't want him to die. But he had the chance to live a life and to make decisions and to be perfect or imperfect. And if you're not going to be angry and you're not going to raise up protesters to protest the killing of 800 black children, that's not even talking about any other ethnicity. We're just talking about the people that are of African-American heritage here in the United States. Approximately 800 every single day. Now, if that does not break your heart, I don't understand it. And if that doesn't infuriate you, if that doesn't make you cry and weep for, for the heart of humanity, then I'm not sure that we can have a dialogue until you can come to that point of understanding. I don't understand how we can have a dialogue for peace. I don't understand that. I don't. It's, I, I'm at a loss. And these last few days and the last few years, my, my heart and my mind have been broken by this, and I've spent the last few days wrestling with this. What in the world is wrong with this world that we, that we and first of all, in this, this the, the unfortunate incident, this terrible incident, this, this travesty of justice that occurred with the officers and Mr. Floyd, I've not yet seen any, any report that would indicate that he was picked out and solely attacked and treated so roughly simply because of his race. There's possibility that it had nothing to do with his race. For us to jump immediately to the idea that it was only about his race and to tear down buildings and to destroy hundreds of buildings and businesses in just the Twin Cities, much less all the ones across the country, for us to jump to that conclusion is, guess what, folks? Racist. You're assuming and assigning a motive to that officer that you don't have any way of knowing whether that in fact is the, the motive behind it. So clearer heads need to prevail. The moderates need to prevail. Those that say, let's wait and find out. Let's let people investigate. He's been arrested. He's been charged. 
the process can stop because they're providing cover for the malcontents, those that want to divide us, those that want to drown out with their babble the clarity of God's love. Because it's clear. Love one another as you love, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And first, you need to love yourself, guys, that are out there hating yourselves. You get right with God, you get right with yourself and love yourself and then love, love, love your neighbor and love your God. And I am, on a, I am on a rant and I apologize for that and I've upset some of you. I've upset a lot of clergy, but a lot of clergy needs to be upset. There's a lot of clergy that have enabled this kind of stuff. And we need to stop it. Because we're not doing God's work. We're not being filled with the Spirit. We're not being loving. We're not being caring. We're perpetuating the problem. We're not kicking the can down the road. We're kicking the can in the air. Let's pick the can up. And let's deal with it. But let's do it as adults. Let's do it with a sense of clarity. Let's do it with a sense of love and understanding. Let's do it in the spirit and the heart of Martin Luther King Jr., who didn't believe in violence. He wanted love to win the day. He didn't want hate, and he didn't want that hate to be South hate either. He didn't want it to be hate from the black community nor from the white community. I believe strongly that if he were alive today, he would be crying the hate that comes from every race. And I think he did in his lifetime. I think his quote there says, returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Seems pretty clear. Let's love one another. Let's pray. You know, the Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these, these times. We hope that you will let us learn from them. We hope that you will lead us through them. We hope that you'll take our hands and bless us. And one thing in closing, I do want to tell, so to speak, one thing that I forgot when I please record this, Gail. Um, watching videos last night, and I watched a lot of stuff in the last few days. Watching videos last night, I saw in, in I believe it was in Minnesota, but it could have been another city because it was starting to get a little confusing. There was a black gentleman who was probably my age or a little older, crying and weeping and screaming at the protesters to stop, that they were not helping that they were destroying his business and others' business. And I can't articulate to you how much I wanted to crawl through that computer screen and give that man a hug and tell him that God loves him, that we love him. And I wanted to take his hand and try to walk together to, to, to try to take care of this problem. I'm not sure that, and I don't, put myself on a pedestal to think that my voice is worthy of being heard, but I think the moderate's voices are worthy to be heard. I think that black man's voice needs to be heard. Listen to 